welcome to episode three of this Sit Up Straight. Now today I'm joined by Peter Barrett, who is a great grandson of an active suffragette who was named Alice Hawkins. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Peter. I'm a retired accountant by profession. But as you say, Daryl, I'm also a great grandson of a suffragette, Alice Hawkins of Leicester. Um, so who was Alice? Alice was um, born in Stafford in 1863, married her husband Alfred, who was a Leicester chap, moved down to Leicester, and uh, she was a shoe machinist by trade, uh, worked in the shoe industry in Leicester right through her life. Six children, obviously including my grandfather, um, and was quite a left-wing radical socialist, a campaigner for change, for equal pay for women. And that was Alice's driving force right through her life. And that's what some of our pupils at the moment, they, 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 they kind of can't get the concept of that equal pay and equal rights haven't always been in existence. And no. even as sort of, as it, say as early as a hundred years ago, you know, in Alice's time, they, they were still like massively far apart. Um, so yes. w when did you first learn about um, Alice? Was it in your childhood or was it in more? Yes, in my childhood, I mean, ma many of the pupils, uh, listening in to the podcast will obviously be learning it through their studies but for me personally I was probably about seven years of age and I was quite close to my uh, maternal grandfather I would go around to see my grandfather in the school holidays and that and he chatted to me about his younger life he was in, in a soldier in the first world war but also he used to talk to me about his mother Alice and granddad often went on the suffragette marches in our hometown of Leicester with his mother and he would give me, uh, relate to me first-hand accounts of being on those marches, of, me, of going to the uh, meetings in Leicester, the, the public meetings in the marketplace in Leicester. And he would tell me stories, tell me how the men in the crowd would heckle the women, heckle his mother when she was public speaking. So I first learned about it from that very early age. And perhaps in a way, that's why I do what I do today, tell the story of Alice Hawkins. And I see you've got some sort of images and some posters behind you. Just, can you just introduce what yes. they have for us? Well, we have Alice over here, which is a photograph of her taken about 1907 in her full suffragette dress. Uh, you can see the sash. We still have that sash in the family. Alice's own sash, still with us. Uh, and then on the right, you can see the statue of Alice, which was unveiled in the marketplace. It's four metres high in the marketplace in Leicester. On March the 4th, sorry, February 4th, 2018, two days before it was the centenary of women first getting the vote, we unveiled the statue of Alice. And we are credited in Leicester with kicking off the centenary year celebrations in the UK. That's an amazing achievement, especially at such a proud moment for your family as well. It was a proud moment, that's right. Absolutely. I mean, um, if we just go back to so that Alice's involvement in the suffragettes, um, did you look at the suffragette movement when you were at school? Or? I probably did. I um, can't quite remember, to, by, to be perfectly honest. Um, but as well as the memories of, uh, related to me by my grandfather of Alice, his mother, we also got this tremendous memorabilia. You know, we still have Alice Sash and Hunger Strike Medal and Prison Notes. In fact, uh, let me show you. I have here today a postcard. It's just one of many. If you can see that postcard, there we go. That's of Mary Gawthorpe. She's personally signed it. It's, she's written to Alice on the back. So we've got this lovely memorabilia. Um, and so I've always had that. And my mum would tell me stories of her granny Alice. So I've learned possibly about the suffragette movement, mainly through the family history and the memorabilia. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we cover it in, in a variety of subjects at school. Um, so we look at it in English when we look at sort of the voting rights for women, we compare the suffragettes and suffragist movement. And of course, it's a massive time in sort of history. Um, but if we look at the suffragettes and suffragist movement, was, was Alice ever um, inclined to join the suffragists movement before the suffragists? Because, you know, there were two completely opposite sides of the well, weren't they? Well, you see, Alice... Uh, born in 1863, goes to work at the age of 13 in shoe factories and sees first-hand accounts, and we're now, what, in the late 1870s. She sees first-hand the injustice of the fact that the women were paid far less than the men in the shoe factories for doing the same type of work. So 
She campaigned right through her life for equal pay, joined the trade union movement, joined the, uh, the Labour Party. Um, she was already an activator for change, politically left wing. Um, but 1907, she's 43 years of age, 20 years of camp, more than 20 years of campaigning for change. She becomes, as she'd been schooled in left wing radical politics, becoming a suffrage, uh, suffragette was just a small step forward from her radical activities that she'd been pursued, but had achieved little through them. Absolutely. I mean, did she, um, how, how far did she get in the suffragette movement? Because obviously we've got people like Melene Pankhurst, who like names are synonymous. She knew them all. She knew them all. Uh, let me show you. Here's, the, here's one of Alice's postcards of um, Emily Pankhurst. And we have another one, her daughter, there's Christabel. These postcards not only passed through Alice's hands, they passed through the Pankhurst hands as well. They were, they were calling cards. Um, Alice got arrested outside Parliament for the first time as a suffragette in 1907, uh, when 300 women were campaigning outside. Uh, she spent 14 days in Holloway Jail. And when she came out, she came back to Leicester as a suffragette and she formed the Leicester branch of the movement. So she is credited with forming the city branch. So through doing that, she came into contact with most of the national leaders. In fact, the Pankhurst came up to Leicester on several occasions to support her in forming the movement and getting it off the ground. So you've got this left-wing radical socialist still working in a shoe factory, but actually mixing and campaigning with women of all social backgrounds. I mean, 14 days in the Holloway prison doesn't sound uh, much fun, does it? We've got her prison notes. If, uh, if you look on, if, you, if the pupils look on my website, alicesuffragette.com, you'll see Alice's prison notes. Actually, and we've, we've transcribed them. She describes her time in prison. It was uh, one long grind from early morning until late at night, but it didn't put her off. No, obviously no. not. Obviously she, she left prison and continued to campaign. She you did. Know, she the qualities campaign. of a remarkable woman who, who thinks that true gender equality is, is, is necessary. And she you know it's not one of these sort of whims where she'll just campaign once and it doesn't, doesn't go ahead. So she's like, well, we'll give up. You know, she, but, she, Alice, but Alice, becoming a suffragette, campaigning for the right to vote was the route to get equal pay for the women in the shoe factories where she worked. All her lawful campaigning for over 20 years, she felt had come to naught. It was the suffragettes who offered the radical change and it offered for Alice the route to empowering women to be able to campaign um, and gain equal pay in the factory where she worked. And did she, did she live to see that go through? Did she? Um... Well, Alice uh, died in 1946. Uh, of course, she didn't get the vote in 1918 because although she was over 30 years of age, neither Alice or her husband Alfred owned property, so they didn't gain the qualification. Alice got the vote, and I asked the pupils listening in, I asked the pupils to think of this. Alice got the vote in 1928, when she was 63 years of age, under the Equal Franchise Act. She was 63 after her lifelong campaigning, five terms of imprisonment. Yeah, I mean, we, we often look at change in citizenship and we, we run an active change campaign each year um, and we often think about how far would you go to advance what you believe in, you know, and the thought of prison would put a lot of people off. But obviously, you know, sh she's got a cause in the back of her mind that she wants to advocate for all women to give this gender equality, you know, and, you know, credit to her yeah. that she, she doesn't give up on what she believes in just because, you know, she's yeah. been punished for what some people believed was were wrong at the time. Um, Absolutely. You know, she continues Absolutely. to that. The, the memories of Alice in the family passed down over generations of a very strong-willed woman who would never back down in a family argument. Absolutely. But she had that grit. She had that grit to see through the injustice. These are times of great poverty. You know, her husband was out of work for many, you know, many occasions, but she was determined. She kept her head up high and she stood up for what she believed in. And that's what brought her through. So, yeah, I know, I know we can't sort of surmise what Alice would say, but if we sort of fast forward a hundred years, so yes. you know the centenary years, clean and gone, 
What do you think Alice would say about sort of gender equality now? Would she be happy with how far it's came or would she still think that it was a, it was a fight? No, she would say there's more to do. I think, and there is more to do. The issue of equal pay is still rattling around. That was, that's just one issue within the gender balance. Uh, and I've visited Parliament on many occasions to uh, speak of Alice and commemorate her with the great support of the staff down there. But you only have to look, sit in the cafe at Portcullis House in Parliament and look around you and look at all the MPs. 80% are men. 80%. Yeah. And, it, and if that's the gender balance in Parliament, what's it like in the rest of industry, in the higher skilled professional jobs? The women need far more opportunities to be able to succeed, to get through in life. So Alice would say there's far more to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've all got issues that we want to campaign for, but, you know, sort of gender equality is, you know, it, it shouldn't be an argument, but it still is an argument. Like you say, there are still issues in workplaces where people are treated unequally, um, perhaps all the sort of pay or conditions. Um, but, you know, if, if we put Alice in the 21st century, and if we put the suffragettes into the 21st century, do you think that they'd be called more radical name, or do you think that they would be just treated as like a pressure group or uh well they would be treated as a pressure group um of course the, the term suffragette was coined by a journalist at the daily mail who wrote, wrote wanted to write an article of derision so he thought well what what can, and this is 1906 he said well, what can i come up with what name can i come up with and he thought well the verb uh, to vote is suffrage and they were all women and in, in the french term the female uh, words often ended in the word E double T E in the grammar, French grammar. So we thought suffrage, the vote, they're all women. I know, I'll call them a suffragette and I'll write a derisory article. And when the women saw that name, they thought, that's a fantastic name. We'll call ourselves suffragettes. I, so know, perhaps, actually, I think Alice. Perhaps in this modern day society. Uh, sorry, Darren. I think, yeah, since the term suffragette, I mean, once they've got something that gives them a label, you know, label, we'll use that and we'll run to the hills with it. Well, it originally, as I say, it was, it was coined as a word of derision, but taken up as their campaigning label. So perhaps today they'd be giving a new, perhaps from the media, but I think they would be seen as quite um, on the edge of acceptability. Mm -hmm. They were prepared to criminal damage, um, you know, and all sorts. So they were there, and this is a hundred years ago. If you, yeah. think that's, if you think that's a, uh, those sorts of activities are difficult to accept today, many people would think about how society felt about them 100 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll never sort of purport the advocation of sort of criminal damage or anything, but, no. but for Alice to get the message across, you know, there has to hit a point where they believed it was right to cross that line. So to get absolutely them, not. you know, if you look at the suffragist movement, you know, they spent sort of 30, 40 years trying to campaign to get sort of this equal role, uh, equal vote, sorry. And then the suffragette movement did a lot more work in a sh shorter period of time. Yes. You know, I mean, it's, it's that sort of balancing act, isn't it, on where do you draw the line? What sort of what success do you get? Does it, is it worth the time or is it sort of worth the prison? And it's, well, I, I draw the, the, I draw the recent comparison of the um, Edward, Edward Colston statue. Now, many people would say, well, it, it's criminal damage to rip down uh, a piece of public art and drag it away and throw it in the river. It's criminal damage and there's no excuse. Other people might say, but hang on, people have been campaigning lawfully for change to have that statue taken down for years and no one's done anything about it and it's all been tied up in bureaucracy very much like perhaps the views that the suffragettes had a hundred years ago. So they said, well, we'll cut through all of that. We'll, we'll do this, whether it's uh, lawful or not. So that's what's happened with the statue recently, the Edward Colson statue, that's uh, split um, divided views, just as the suffragettes, uh, the public's view of the suffragettes a hundred years ago was equally divided. Absolutely, and like I say, some people who have taken part in those campaigns and those protests yeah. They're willing to take that risk and they're willing to sort of get the slap on the wrist or the, the prison sentence that might be for the criminal damage. Absolutely. It's a standard yeah. they believe in, much like Alice yeah. stood for the rights of women. Um, so if we just have a look, at, I got a quote from one of our history teachers um, mm. and he's compared to the suffragettes movement and Martin Luther King. 
And he yeah. said that Martin Luther King said that non-violence was the way forward, whereas the suffragettes maintained the campaign of action, not words. Both had the civil rights at heart, but do you think there is such a massive difference between those approaches? Do you think that there is a distinct yeah. sort of violence or sort of actions, not words, as the suffragettes coined, and sort of Martin Luther King's of non-violence? Do you, do you think there can be sort of clear cut and dry? It's a, it's a difficult one because I think different circumstances, different times. Um, it's a difficult one for me to answer. I think the Pankhurst family, when they took control of the WSPU in 1903 in Manchester, caught the moment, caught that moment in time when all of the women's frustrate, many women's frustration at the lack of change had boiled to a point where when this radical new approach was taken by the, the Pankhursts and the suffragette movement, they went along with it. Whether that's the same circumstances in America, I can't really say. I mean, the issue of equal rights obviously has been going along for many, many years. Perhaps it's, um, I'm not too sure. I can't, I can't give you a straight answer on that. All I can say is that I think, as I say, the Pankhurst caught the moment of, the, caught the moment of time. And, and, the, and the radical approach they took was uh, a response to years and decades of um, stagnation in the issue of uh, equality. I mean, you, you mentioned there sort of the, the years and the decades of sort of this sort of feeling of that they're not, they're not getting anywhere and that they're slowly chipping away at this rock. Mm. You know, it's kind of like that clip out of... Um, Shawshank Redemption, where he, he makes the rocks and he's noise, he's got oh, yeah, yeah. He chips away and chips away, and slowly, you know, mm. this big massive opening appears for them. I mean, how how long into Alice's life did she campaign? Was it right the way up until she she passed, or was it? Did she sort yes. of? Well, well, politically, she was a member of the Labour Party until uh, her death in 1946, and she did campaign for the party on its issues. Um, of course, like, like many women, once the suffragette movement came to an abrupt end at the start of the First World War, um, that, that finished and she continued with her day job as a shoe machinist. Um, one of the earliest memories uh, in the family that I, I, I found out, um, my, mom's, my mom's passed away, she's grand, obviously a granddaughter of Alice, but her cousin, Madge, who is a granddaughter, is now 95. And I said to Madge a few years ago, what do you remember about Alice? And she said, well, I remember when I was about seven years of age, so this was about 1930, um, Alice would take me in the school holidays round to see women who were what they call outworkers, uh, making components for shoes in their back sheds and what have you. And she would go from house to house, seeing the women and seeing if they needed any support or help, any issues on pay or conditions. So she always looked out for the women. And in fact, in 1911, going back slightly, Alice and other women formed their own trade union movement as um, a breakaway movement from the main shoe union to uh, gain better pay deals uh, for the women specifically. Because often in the, in the negotiations, the men in the union would come out with a, a great deal for the men and nothing for the women. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, mm. Union lasted until the 1930s. I mean, we, we, we've covered in citizenship um, sort of the Equal Pay Act, sort of the Dagenham girls in the 70s, um, yeah. you know, 80 years on from when Alice was in a factory. Same issues. And, you know, they, they were looking at, they had to go through this interview process to show that they were skilled machinists. Mm. And then when they got the job as a skilled machinist, they were classed as being unskilled yeah. you know, in comparison yeah. to the men. And it's sort Absolutely of... Right. That took another sort of 16 years from when they started campaigning, you know, not as violent, well, not violent at all. Um, so that sort of, they were just the sort of the peaceful protesting of, we want equal pain. And, you know, 16 years is a long time to fight this yeah, battle. Yeah. You know, and, you know, Alice did it for, for decades, like you say. But, you know, even sort of, what are we, 50 years ago, it, there's still that division, clear division between... Yes, yes, that's right. ...male and female pay. Yeah, it's it still, I mean... Um... In 2018, I was very kindly invited to be on the BBC Antiques Roadshow in a special edition called Pioneering Women, and I went down for the day's filming. And there were two elderly ladies waiting to be filmed for the, uh, the, the programme. 
And I said to them, um, if you don't mind my asking, why are you here? And they said, oh, we're uh, two of the women from the Dagenham Ford factory, where we went on strike in 1967, was it, for equal pay. And those women were, you know, led directly to the first Equal Pay Act in the late 60s with Barbara Castle. Um, so it was a proud moment for me to meet these two women who were doing what Alice was doing, but they were doing it 50, 60 years on. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just shows you the struggle isn't over. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, do you think that, I know you, you said you're an accountant and you're not a teacher, so that, you know there's no sort of particularly, <laughs> uh, influence you could have here, but do you think that sort of people know enough about people like Alice? Alice? No, it, it, you get a very mixed response. Um, many, uh, if we, we talk about adults for a moment, many adults, some have hardly heard of the word. Some have absolutely heard it. They've seen the film Suffragette and that, you know, they, they're really up for learning about it all. Or, or many people think, oh, I've heard of the Suffragettes. Um, and they'll name the Pankhurst, but they can't think of it. There's no other names that they know in the suffragette movement. And then in schools, of course, it's entirely dependent on whether the schools uh, take the subject on either in history or in citizenship. And I visited schools in Leicester extensively and, and other areas as well, where they've, it's been a core, a core subject within the, year, the academic year. But then other schools just merely... Um, touch on it and then have to move on because their curriculum so it's a very mixed response um, but my overriding view is that you know through through learning more about suffragettes what they did and why they did it it will encourage particularly young people to place a value on a, a human right a basic human right that they have today you know, that's the right to vote it was hard fought for um, Alice once said to my mum, that was her granddaughter, once said, you must use your vote, we suffered for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's the message that I always take into schools. Yeah. Whenever you can, use your vote. The women of this country fought hard for that over 100 years ago. Yeah, I mean, we, we, when we look at voting, we look at, so I think, I think the turnout was about 61% for the last, sort of, last couple of elections. Yeah, or even less than others. You know, you're thinking sort of nearly 40% of people. Are, but then do you look at the fact that they don't vote as a, as a vote in itself? Or do you think that people should still use that vote? Well, I think the, the, the difficulty is, you know, we could go into the complexity of this. In a lot of uh, constituencies, they're considered safe seats where regardless of the opposition vote, the Labour MP or the, or the, uh, sorry, the Labour candidate or the conservative candidate will always get in because predominantly that's a reflection of the of the uh, views of the population within the constituency but my view is that you should you should vote because there'll be far more change you will be able to push for change if far more if if the other 40 percent would use their vote i think the politics of the country would start to change not in all constituencies, but in many constituencies, where it would upend the predictions of, 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 of the various parties and who's going to come through. And of course, different subject, but if you would give the vote to 16 to 18 year olds, then I think you'd see even more change in the country. And I think the needs of young people would take up more time of the MPs and the government than it does today. Yeah, I mean, we, we look at sort of comparison to other systems um, so we look at Australia where it's sort of mandatory to vote, yeah. but if you don't vote, I think it's like a $20 fine if you don't vote. I mean, well, I, yeah. you know, in, in theory, sort of $20, if you don't want to vote, it's $20, mm -hmm. but you get sort of a million, two million people that don't vote, you yeah. know, that, that money starts to sort of chug up and so like that's $40 million. Yes, that's right. It's, it's a complex situation. I mean, I think it's partly an issue of, uh, um, the archaic voting system that we have in the UK. I mean, to young people, I'm saying people under 40 years of age who are used to doing everything electronically these days, now that, you know, once every five years or less, they're being asked to walk down to a polling station somewhere and put a tick on a piece of paper. You could argue that that in itself is a barrier to encouraging 
a section of the population in terms of demographics to actually vote. And I, again, would be an agent for change on that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've looked at sort of the kind of digital democracy of, of ways to get more people involved in, in the voting systems. Um, I mean, if, if we move back to Alice, and if we look yeah. at, if you've got the statue there for her. Yeah. Um, and so you had that commemorated for the centenary year. And oh. I, you know, I've directed my peoples um, and people for the podcast to look at the, your, the video that you did with De Montfort University. Um, yeah, and we saw that you, uh, a plaque on the, on the place where Alice worked. Yeah. Yeah, do you, do you think correct. that's enough to sort of um, commemorate all that Alice did? Or do you think, is, is there more that you've done that we haven't perhaps seen? Um, well, the plaque is, is, is a great uh, achievement, a recognition to Alice. The statue, of course, excuse me, was, is fantastic. I mean, it was one of five suffrage statues unveiled in 2018. And it was the first in, in, in that year, centenary year. So in itself, it's a great icon. Alice but and also the statue is there for generations to come so you know I, I hope in itself through personal people visiting the statue or seeing it online it will encourage them to think well who was Alice Hawkins and why did she do what she did it's, it's a trigger yeah black the statue they're triggers for people to find out more about the likes of Alice Alice being representative of the rank and file of the suffragette movement. If we could put Alice in 2020, mm. and I know again it's a difficult conversation to um, sort of predict, but based on what you know and what you sort of your family's passed down and everything yeah. that you know about Alice's character, do you think that Alice would have been happy with everything that she'd done to the point where she passed? Do you think that she would have thought she's done everything that she possibly could? I, and other times, I think so. if, you, if you take everything that Alice did in the round, her early campaigning in the trade union movement for women's rights, her um, formation with others of, of a women's trade union movement, um, if you take everything in the round, and later in life when she's retired, visiting women to, to see for their needs and what have you. Um, I think in the round for a working woman with six children, you know, my mouth to feed. Um, I think she did a pretty good job personally. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's hard to sort of crit we're not criticizing, but you know, I, I if I had achieved that much, you know, in in the time when I didn't, if I was a woman and I didn't have much of a say, and I achieved all that Alice did and sort of started that ball moving and that avalanche sort of starting to form. You know, I, I think I would be pretty proud of everything I had accomplished. Like you say, taking aside all of the um, the suffragette movement and the sort of the mm. voting and the protesting, supporting the family, you know, keep yep. food on the table, you know, because yep. she could have lost a job. And did, did, did she ever sort of get cut from a job? Or do you know? Or? Well, no, what we haven't touched on it, but one of the great benefits in Alice's life was that she joined a factory, a shoe factory called the Equity Shoes in the 1880s. And it was one of the very first workers cooperatives in the UK, which is probably why she joined it. They allowed her to take time off for her political campaigning. Um, so they were very, because it was owned by the workers, uh, and it was very successful as a shoe factory, um, it gave her that uh, ability to, as I say, to campaign, take time off, um, it was a great company. Uh, it had its own workers' library to educate the semi-literate workers. Um, so she had, and also her husband Alfred. He was a great. He supported the women's cause. He heckled Winston Churchill on one occasion when Alice was refused entry into the meeting that he was holding in Leicester. He went in and heckled Churchill on the issue of women in the vote, and got arrested for it. Um, so she had some great um, supports in life. Uh, and that's enabled her to, to do what she did. I mean, you mentioned there that sort of her husband was arrested for it. And you, you mentioned previously that Alice had been arrested five times in total. Yes. What what were the other arrests for? Was it sort of just the uh, same well, disobedience or was it the... Um, what was she arrested for? Um, she, was arrest, she was arrested on Black Friday, Black November down in London, 1911, when the, all the suffragettes took to the streets to campaign, when the bill had been uh, killed by Parliament, it would give women the vote. She was arrested for breaking windows. Apparently, she stood on that occasion. She stood in full view of a police officer 
and threw a brick through the home office window, a window at the home office. 1913, she went to prison in Leicester for uh, digging up the golf, a local golf course with four of the women. They went in the dead of night and dug out the turf of the putting green. No boats for women, no golf for men. Absolutely true, and got arrested for it. And then she got arrested for pushing, uh, uh, pouring ink through the letterbox of the town hall in the dead of night. So when they opened the doors in the morning, this black printer's ink was all over the Italian marble floor. So general acts of criminal damage and, and, and what have you. Well, it, it, you can see it, it's a way to get her message across. And again, we're not yeah. saying, you know, anyone listening to the podcast, go out and commit these crimes. No, but, that's right. Yeah. You know, we, we, we can say that perhaps Alice thought there was a justification to, to the... She did think there was a justification. Yes, that's right. And, and again, I would come back to, for the pupils, think of Alice... 1907 becomes a suffragette for the first time, but at the age of 43. Now, life expectancy in the early 1900s was probably 50 to 55 years of age. So she's comparatively old to come towards joining a radical movement like this, campaigning for over nearly 25 years for lawful change, born out of frustration. Absolutely. I mean, when we looked at sort of Pankhurst, when we look at Davison, you know, putting herself in front of so yeah. horse cart. Was, was Alice sort of in those movements as well? You know, would, would she have taken part in the same movements as sort of these, these moments in history that people are, are aware of? Um, uh, well, she, she didn't, I don't think she knew Emily Davison. Um, but she, as you say, the big icon of the protest, the suffragette post, was Black Friday, Black November. She was there. She was one of the women arrested. Um, in the National Archives in, in Kew, you'll find Alice's statement of that very day, Black Friday, uh, to Henry Brailsford, a left-wing journalist who took a statement of about 60 uh, suffragettes, how they've been brutally beaten up by the police, and it was brutal. So Alice's uh, statement is in the National Archives, and also in the National Archives is Alice's address to Lloyd George in 1913, when she goes to London as part of, of a deputation of working class women and she speaks to Lloyd George about equal pay, about the conditions in the factories in Leicester and she implores him to support the cause. So we do have moments in history and of 1907 when Alice is arrested outside Parliament we've still got her bail warrant from the police station on that very night. Again you can find that on the website. Yeah so, I mean if we... Points in history. Yeah, if we direct our pupils, is it Alice Suffragettes? Is it .co .uk or .com? It's both, actually. I've got two, two uh, domains. So if we look at Alice Suffragette .com or Alice Suffragette .co .uk, uh, yeah. all of the information from, from everything that Pete has spoken about today is available there. And, of course, you've got videos on YouTube if you just search for um, Peter Barrett or Alice Suffragette. Um, you'll find an abundance of videos there. Yeah. But um, Peter, on behalf of, of, of my pupils um, and anyone else that's yeah. listening to the podcast, I'd like to thank you for giving up your time this morning. Um, okay. And hopefully, if anyone's got any more questions, they can use the hashtag CUSFE3 and you know, I, I can email you, Peter, and we'll get back to you and I'll sort of retweet those, those responses out. Um, but thank you for joining us, Peter, and Thanks. hopefully we'll sort of speak again soon. All the best. Thank you. Ah, you never knew me, Nana. She died four years ago. She lived in that old fox home in my side, you know. I used to go on Sundays, I sometimes took the kids. I was always so proud of what she did. Nana was a suffragette. Almost the last alive Nana was a suffragette Over 95 She signed votes for women It's just the beginning You haven't seen anything yet Oh, Nana was a suffragette When I was young I treasured An old photo of my nan Speaking to the workers From a clarion van 
You wouldn't think it of her She looks so frail and ill But on that day Nana emptied all the women from the mill Nana was a suffragette Never thought to fail Nana was a suffragette Spent the night in jail Singing votes for women Is just a beginning You haven't seen anything yet Oh, Nana was a suffragette The proudest day of Nana's life Was when the vote was won The papers said it's over But Nana just begun Her women's committee Went on to better things And they challenged the union The council and the wedding rings Nana was a suffragette Only five feet tall Nana was a suffragette Took on City Hall, singing votes for women is just the beginning. You haven't seen anything yet. Oh, Nana was a suffragette. Now here I'm standing with my college degree. And my own kids have more options than Nana could achieve. But if you think we're satisfied, take a look around. There's a lot of angry women, won't let their nanas down. Nana was a suffragette, it's as if she's still alive. Nana was a suffragette, their voices still survive. Singing votes for women is just a beginning. You haven't seen anything yet. Oh, Nana was a suffragette. Now here I'm standing with my college degree. And my own kids have more options than Nana could achieve. She goes on. Their voices still survive Singing votes for women Is just the beginning You haven't seen anything yet Oh, Nana was a suffragette